Welcome and to the first lecture of the spring semester. Um, a special occasion, um, this lecture being on Friday. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark, Mark Gage for tonight. Um, but also, to, on top of the lecture, as probably you all know by now, the, after this, we'll have the opening of the installation that Mark and a, a big team put together. Um, just, just a little bit of house cleaning. This, was, uh, this is part of a large collaboration between SIAC and Yale, in which Mark is a professor and assistant dean there. So it's part of this, the studio that he's doing this semester and also was part of the installation and hopefully will be the continuation of what it has been in the past, an informal dialogue between the two schools. This is probably the first formal thing and we'll see if we can keep it going in the near future. Um, as I've many times I mentioned before, it's kind of tricky when you have to introduce one of your, your friends and one of your close friends and colleagues. And I know Mark for much longer than we both of us would like to admit. Um, actually, I met him for the first time when he still was a student in, in Yale. And he had by far the worst project in the studio that I was invited as a critic. Uh, I would like to say that he has improved since then, but it remains to be seen. Um, but um, Mark, Mark has a very peculiar, unique quality in the current discourse and discussion for many reasons. One, um, because uh, he is, of course, a designer and a teacher and, and all that. But also he takes very seriously the, the role of writing and to be, um, I will not say a critic, but cer certainly somebody who comments and is all the time shaping discourse in the current concert. But at the same time, uh, he's part of a group of a group of people that, over the time, embrace a lot of a new critical shift. They came in the last 25 years through computers and many other tools. But at the same time, he's one of the ones who advocate for a certain relation and placement in historical relationship. But at the same time, to be very aware how this can relate with popular culture. This is not an easy task, and I think this is a very risk risky proposition, at the same time trying to operate in the concert of, to have a practice in New York, which also has its tricks. So he's a guy who wears multiple hats. And the other aspect which I think is crucial, crucially important is, he's one of the main advocates of the role of aesthetics, and aesthetics not as a problem of taste or a problem of just form, but aesthetics as a political and social agency. And as such, he has been embracing in many, many endeavors from organizing symposium to um, battling for hours and hours with Patrick Schumacher, which for only that he will deserve recognition. And if you haven't seen, I recommend him to see the video of that debate. Um, I don't know who won, but for sure Mar Mark looks funnier and handsome um, more than Patrick. But um, in any case, this is an interesting debate because we are the only discipline and the only profession probably that we are so stupid to argue within the family. <laughs> so like uh, we keep arguing, like not understanding that if there is an enemy, like my predecessor, you always like to claim, it's not really among us, but it's somewhere outside there. But we like to spend time fighting on that. But that's not here or there. So I'm going back to Mark. The other thing which is interesting is how this integrate with a kind of a playful uh, and sometimes provocative way to think. So, I consider Mark uh, a true, um, a, a, a true pioneer. Not not pioneer is the wrong word, but a true, interesting um, architect who rethinks our relation between what is the role of popular culture, what is what is the role of technology, what is the role of tradition and historical understanding, and it has to do with his own, his own biography, but mostly because he's fearless in trying to try new things, and this is something that sometimes we tend to forget in the concerts of the discussion between what constitutes discipline. And to me, at the end of the day, that's, that's the most important part. As I always say, a school like SIAG is committed to the notion of the discipline way more than it's committed to any other ramification that have to do with architecture. So it is my pleasure and, and, and truly honor to have Mark teaching this, this semester here in SIAG and speaking tonight and an opening later but I didn't want to finish in some solemn way, so I found a video 
from the future with man will get a little bit older who states what is really his philosophy towards design. I love gold. The look of it, the taste of it, the smell of it. The... Please welcome Margage. First of all, of course, thank you, Hernan, for the opportunity to be talking here. Um, I'd also just like to put a shout out to all the people who worked on the installation, and in particular, Melissa Shin, who's up there in the front row. Raise your hand. If it falls down, it's her fault. If it's great and you love it, it's all me. Um, but no, it's really an, a, a great opportunity to do this collaboration. I've been, um, this is my 18th year teaching at Yale, and I think one of the things I've enjoyed most is this informal dialogue. We've had between schools. So we've had a lot of the cast of characters from Cyarch out to Yale, probably less in the other direction, but it's a dialogue that I've come to really respect. And you all are in very good hands here in the school. I spend a lot of time in other architecture schools and I can say this is uh, not only one of my favorite places to be in terms of architecture school, it was just one of my favorite places on earth. That you're in the hands of a really dedicated and optimistic and progressive group of people that's actually rare to have in an architecture school, that you have collaborators who actually like each other. And I would say that this is a group of people that celebrates each other's victories more than being competitive, which is extremely rare. And if you're going to move forward in architecture and know nothing else uh, about it that you've learned other than the architecture itself, try to find a cabal of people that share similar ideas that you can have ongoing discussions with because it makes your profession and your career all that much more valuable. And I think a lot of those people are here in the room tonight. So thank you to all of you. You know who you are, except Florencia, who's always just so awful to speak with. <laughs> Florencia is also uh, teaching at Yale this semester, which is a nice exchange, and she'll be giving a uh, talk next week um, there, and she told me that she wanted to catch my lecture so she knows exactly what not to do at Yale. <laughs> but I wanna talk about, uh, this is kind of some new material, but it comes out of some philosophy and writing and things that I've been doing, but I wanna talk about the conceptual framework through which we understand reality. Uh, and I think it probably exists somewhere in between these two posters, one for Reality Bites, the 1994, um, movie and uh, The Handmaid's Tale on the right, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. But what I want to talk about is what's been referred to as the great flattening. And by flattening, I mean a removal of systems of hierarchy within multiple disciplines, and those include philosophy, certainly Cyarch here with the presence of Graham Harmon and David Rue and the introduction of object-oriented ontology into the discourse, know about uh, the flattening of ontologies, the, the removal of the primacy of the human subject in favor of an equal ontology as a way to think new ideas about uh, reality and new, new ideas about architecture. But this great flattening uh, isn't only in philosophy, it happens in um, uh, subjects like social rights, social equality, you see movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, that there's a real drive for people who have rights to exercise those rights when in the past they have been more dramatically previously oppressed. This is by no means um, a completed task, but you see a drive in circles of social justice towards this type of flat equality. You see it in economic structures, which I would say in America we're probably the worst at, but you see movements like Bernie Sanders or Occupy Wall Street calling for an addressing of income inequalities. But the one thing I wanna talk about a little bit more is the flattening of the media. So in the past, uh, most of the 20th century, you had this kind of uh, Meryl Streep figure on the left. If you just saw that movie, The Post with Tom Hanks, this is what that's from. But it's basically a story about uh, the editing of news, the editing of reality. So in the past, you had a structure where there was news, there were journalists, it all funneled to an editor, and that's what's called an integrity gap. And in that integrity gap, you would have an editor, you would have an ombudsman in a news organization whose only job was to decide whether or not it was truthful and accurate. Once that decision had been made, then the cone switches and it was broadcast to the population. So there was a kind of funneling effect, which is a form of a hierarchy that went to a limited group of people, which we used to call journalists. And that group of journalists turn around and rebroadcast it to the rest of um, our culture. 
So one of the after effects or side effects of this great flattening is that we've had a flattening of media. And Michael Young writes very eloquently on this, uh, most recently in an article um, in the most recent issue of Log, but he talks about the internet being a flat archive of information. So for the first time in human history, humans aren't being given information, they're going to get information. And what that produces in society is a little bit of a problem because humanity, or at least American culture, hasn't really developed good defenses against that much information, which means that there's a skewed idea of reality in many different bubbles, many different circumstances um, that you're all familiar with. But some of the statistics that go along with that, and it's been referred to as like trying to drink from a fire hose, that there's so much information and people are unable to suss out what's true and what's not. But some of the statistics done by a recent Stanford study um, were that 50% of Facebook users believe that a piece of news is true if it includes a logo or a graphic. 80% of Facebook users believe that if an article includes the word sponsored content, it's more likely to be true. Four out of 10 students believe that if there was a picture of a deformed daisy on the same page as an article on Fukushima, that it meant Fukushima was causing radiation mutations. And probably most scary is that preteens, obviously people from zero to 12, spend an average every day of seven and a half hours online outside of school. And that's seven and a half hours in which people are absorbing information, none of which has been vetted. So this is, this is the downside of the flattening. And the true downside is that that media has an impact on assumptions about reality and how we understand reality. So you know this picture, uh, obviously, you recognize uh, Florencia there with her youngest daughter. <laughs> um, but you see Donald Trump's tweets here saying, don't believe sources said in quotes, because obviously there's a problem with recognizing the truth. And then in the very next tweet, it's an incredibly credible source that he doesn't name has called and told me that Obama's birth certificate is a fake. So there's a problem uh, in how Americans are thinking about reality and the realities they're being given. Some statistics that go along with that are 85, this is a Newsweek study, a Newsweek magazine from July of this year, 58, uh, sorry, 85% of Republicans believe that the free press has a negative impact on the country. 58% of Republicans say colleges and universities have a negative impact on the country. Now what kind of reality do you have to exist in that those statistics make sense? What type of reality do you have to exist in where you believe that the free press is bad for a country? What information are you being given that teaches you that? And how is it that so many people believe it? So there's some things we can do about this. One is, this is my Trump library. I was asked by a publication to design a Trump library, so this is it. And I actually present it as an example of what not to do. So I'm gonna list off six ways that people are thinking about addressing this problem with reality and the political consequences of it. One is satire and smugness, which this is, that we're just gonna be smug and uh, feel superior. So you get areas like, uh, let's see, um, this is B is the vault for Kellyanne Conway's soul. Uh, J is the uh, hall of caged nasty women. Um, o is the hall of actual accomplishments. A is mostly empty. Um, and K, K, L, and M are unknown because they're owned by Vladimir Putin. Uh, but satire and smugness only gets us so far. We can only watch The Daily Show and MSNBC to feel better about ourselves so much, but that really doesn't have any significant impact. Um, <clears throat> another way of, sorry, I wanna stay on this slide for a minute. Uh, thinking about this is uh, another solution is through critical thinking, which is a philosophy of thought which emerged from the Frankfurt School in the 30s and has been guiding much of architectural social agenda for the last three or four decades. But in a sense, what it says is that there's a true reality and it's intellectuals and academics 
job to reveal that reality for people can't, who can't understand it for themselves. So that's actually a very hierarchical proposition, that there's a reality that other people can't understand, but we'll give that to them. And I think that that project, largely in philosophy, is at a dead end, notably for a lot of the writings by Jacques Rancière, who has a famous statement where he says the, the oppressed are rarely, um, the oppressed are rarely, uh, un, uh, the oppressed rarely are unsure of the circumstances of their oppression. That people don't need to be told how they're being oppressed, people know how they're being oppressed. And that criticality is actually at a dead end in terms of its ability to address social inequality. Uh, we can call out the producers as liars, we can call Donald Trump a liar, but that doesn't change the political situation at all. We can search for real data, and instead of saying, okay, Obama was born in Kenya, we can produce the real birth certificate that says he was done in, uh, born in Hawaii. And of course, the production of real data just gets lost in the fire hose. We can ignore the problem, which is an architectural position right now being advocated by Michael Meredith, and he wrote an article in Log, which I responded in a subsequent Log, that indifference is a sort of uh, valid response that's happened before in history in various art practices. I disagree with that strongly, but I'm glad that there's someone articulating it in an intellectual and rigorous way. So I look forward to having more of that debate moving forward. Uh, but then there's another strategy called uh, aesthetic disruptions of the real, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight. Now, aesthetic disruptions of the real include a number of different categories, some existing, some not yet invented, but include counterfactuality and parafictions. Michael Young also writes really eloquently on the latter. A lot of my work is dealing a little bit with the former. But you see evidence of these types of practices happening in other industries. So Black Mirror is essentially a counterfactual proposition that says if technology has developed or developed in this certain way, these are some of the possible outcomes. And what gives Black Mirror its power is that it happens in a recognizable reality. You realize that they're using iPhones and Apple products and how society is spun out of control in some of those scenarios. So it's using speculative fiction, uh, counterfactual ideas, to produce a future which tells us a lot about our present. The Handmaid's Tale, which is on Hulu, um, even has some of the ads that say we are not so different. It's a counterfactual premise that a political regime has taken control of the United States and takes full control over women's bodies. And you know that it happens in the United States because they have Chevy Suburbans and American houses and a 2014 Mercedes. There's recognizable things that tells us this is happening in your reality. And the reason The Handmaid's Tale has become so potent is because the political regime in which we exist is so close to tipping in that direction. Not necessarily becoming that, but we're one Supreme Court justice away from women using, losing legal control of their uterus. And it's not a huge step to go from losing control of your uterus to losing control of the rest of your body. Which is why The Handmaid's Tale is garnering so many awards and being written about so frequently. Parafictional practices like Damien Hirst's most recent uh, Treasures from the Wreck of the Unbelievable, uh, he comes up with a premise. And the, the premise is that he's discovered uh, an Egyptian pharaoh's treasure barge that sank in the Indian Ocean. And he's paid all of the money to recover these items, which he's then selling on the art market. So he did these sculptures, submerged them all, hired scuba divers to lift them back up so he could take the photographs and legitimize this as a real, legitimate, um, fiction, like a uh, parafictional argument. But he provides clues that it's not real in the fact that this is Mickey Mouse. So if this barge sank 2,000 years ago, how would you bring up a Mickey Mouse uh, statue that's covered in 2,000 years worth of coral and aging? How is that possible? There's little areas where he peels up the very fabric of the reality that he's producing. And the idea of parafictional art is that it encourages people to do that with their own realities. That there's a correlation between being asked to do that in a creative practice and being willing to do that in your own life. The idea being that uh, you're not being told what reality is, you're being encouraged to look at what's been given to you 
as your own reality, as a description of your own reality. Now, surprisingly enough, Hal Foster, who's the eminent art critic, founder of October, one of the most important figures in terms of critical thinking, seems to have taken a turn towards this realist and parafictional argument, and he asks, what relationship could there possibly be, or might there be, between these types of parafictional art practices and the production of fake news and fake realities? And the question is being asked, the question is being asked by me, by a number of people who I'm involved with in architecture, by people in the art world, by people in entertainment. And there are no definitive solutions, but it's a project that's on the table that I think is probably more promising than some of the other avenues that uh, I spoke about earlier. Now, the interesting thing about Treasures from the Wreck of the Unbelievable is that Damien Hirst is spent an estimated $50 million of his own money producing the project, and it's estimated that it'll bring in over $2 billion on the art market. And what it's adding to the $50 million worth of hard cost is fiction, is fiction in a kind of art scene where people, where the artist is creating not only the art objects, but the reality in which it's embedded, but providing clues as to the fictionality of that reality. Now, that's interesting to architects why I've spent 15 minutes talking about the conceptual framework of reality. Now, as it turns out, architecture has a very deep and long history of, of calibrating people's perception of reality. So if you look at a project like the Parthenon from Periclean Greece, roughly 400 BC, there's a number, and I'm sure you get this in your history classes, of optical refinements, where the Greek architects realized that things didn't look perfect to the human eye when they got to be of a certain scale, so they were manipulated to look perfect. Some of the, um, let's say, design moves are that the architrave and frieze tilt uh, at a one to 12 ratio forward, so they're not actually flat. There's not actually a straight line in the entire Parthenon, which you may or may not have heard before. The stylobate is curved here. Not only is the stylobate and the entire floor curved, but the actual foundations themselves were curved to give the floor a more solid, straight appearance. They found that when you build things this large and use actual straight lines, they look to humans like they're sagging. So they're already correcting the perceptual apparatus that humans have. Vitruvius, which is 400 years later, 31 BC, writes his 10 books of architecture, and he gives an analogy of oars in the water. When you look at an oar in the water, to humans, it looks like it's broken because the water reflects the light from the oar, but you know it's not broken. So how do architects calibrate that reality to match the actual truth of the situation? And he says that he gives the rules he tells us everything there is to know about architecture in 31 BC, or 31, yeah. Uh, where to get the lime for our concrete, how to design the columns, the proportions, the limitations of everything that you can do. And he says very prominently, uh, you do all this, but if it doesn't look right to people, you should just change it. <laughs> that there's like a reality and perceptual disclaimer in the very first book ever written on architectural theory. Certainly architecture has a different sort of relationship with uh, reality in the Renaissance, where Brunelleschi in 1421 did his infamous experiment where he rediscovered how to produce what's called a horizon line isosophily, which is a type of perspective that allows you to calculate distance away from the human. And he basically stood here and took a series of mirrors and traced what he was receiving on the mirrors to understand how perspective worked. And perspective, although we hear the term a lot, it's actually the ability for humans to not only calibrate and understand what they're seeing, to but to predict how they're gonna see certain things, which is why perspective was so influential in the Renaissance, largely responsible for the Renaissance, but it kicked off a period of creativity, an unrivaled period in creativity called humanism because it returned the view from God's view to the human's view and re-gave them the ability to calculate with their perceptual apparatus. So what that looks like in disciplines like geometry is you get in roughly 1340, you have uh, late medieval uh, drawings of a cylinder. And if you were a monk drawing a cylinder in 1250, 1350, you would understand if you held a cylinder in your hand that it has a circle on the top and a circle on the bottom and there's lines connecting these things. 
it would not have occurred to you to draw a, a cylinder in perspective and shade it how it appears to your eyes. That was not part of people's conceptual apparatus. They were drawing something which clued them into the idea of cylinder without drawing an actual cylinder. Because how things look to you weren't important. How things look to God were important. You see, the change in that from 1350 roughly in these cylinder drawings to 1450 on the right, which is uh, the world's first wireframe, 1450, drawn by Uccello which is an absolute calculation and mastery of the relationship between form and perspectival, uh, let's say, absorption, uh, absorption of information. Again, around 1350 on the left, you have one of the first images of pre-Renaissance uh, Florence, and you can see the baptistry here, which is how you know it's Florence. And there's general relative locations that we know that this building is actually you know, in front of the baptistry compared to the uh, I think it's Palazzo Vecchio. So there's an idea that this is Florence, but there's no perceptual apparatus that shows depth. So this was done a century before this. This is after perspective. This is called the map in chains because it has this very famous border, which I accidentally cropped off, that's chains. Um, but it's entirely done in perspective. So within 100 years, something shifted in the conceptual apparatus of humans that allowed us to see the world like this, to see the world like this. And that idea was invented by an architect, Filippo Brunelleschi, one of the first architects of the Renaissance. It continued the following century. In the 16th century, um, you see characters like Palladio. Now, at the time, you all know there weren't very many books. So if something was put into a book, it was legitimized as important and true. Most writing at this time was religious. So if you had a book, which was very unlikely, it meant that the stuff in the book was incredibly important. Palladio does really one of the first architectural monographs and shows all of his projects, not as they were built, but as he wanted them to have been. And in a similar way to Damien Hirst revealing the kind of falseness of his hubris of creating this false reality, he makes mistakes which may have been intentional, may have not been, but on the left is uh, Villa, uh, uh, Villa Valmarana and Lisiera on the left, which is actually uh, the, the drawings in the four books make the building too big to fit on the site where it was actually constructed. And in Villa Cornaro on the right, if you take his overall dimensions and compare them to the interior's dimensions, it means that it would require negative wall thickness. So there's already this use of fiction and calibration of reality when we present architecture in 1550 to the general public through representation. Now, the framework that we're in right now is a descendant of the Enlightenment. On the left, you have a taxonomy by Carl Linn, who came up with something called Linnaean taxonomy, which I'm sure you all actually got a piece of in like high school biology class, but he's the guy that invented the ideas of categorization in terms of family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. Choisy developed the first axonometric, which is a way of seeing the world that's completely divorced from human reality. Humans don't see in axonometric, they see in perspective. And you get the introduction of the grid by Durand around the same time in 1873. And it's interesting that there is such a push to see things scientifically, not perceptually, that in 1873, there was a professor named Julien Gaudet at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is the oldest and probably longest running architecture school in human history, who protested the establishment of a chair of aesthetics because aesthetics would be the production of perception, the reintroduction of perception. He also developed a system of classifying architecture by program, which is active today. If you go look in any architecture store, you get books on residences, you get green residences, you get museum books. But there's a kind of ambition to categorize things in this enlightenment way. And this is one of the things Graham is kind of introducing to philosophical discourse is that when you look at things in categories, you're more concerned with their relationship with each other than the things themselves. Now, so we know that there's this massive global <laughs> crisis in reality. And on one side, you have this problem, and on the other side, you have a discourse called architecture, which for 2,300 years was very active in how humans perceive reality, but for the last 200 years, we've largely forgotten how. So I think architects at the moment have a choice whether to continue along certain lines or start to think in different terms in a new conceptual framework. 
So, sorry, this is, this discourse is called aesthetics, the discourse that is about how we relate to reality. And there's people in a lot of industries working on this problem, uh, including myself, but also Hal Foster, Timothy Morton, philosophers like Jacques Rancière and Graham Harmon, architects like uh, Michael Young, and even like news broadcasters like Barbara Gladstone, who wrote an incredible new, very small text called The Trouble with Reality. And one of my favorite moments is in architectural history is Viollet le Duc around the mid 19th century when there was an introduction of cast iron into architecture and architects really had no idea what to do with it. So they solved old problems with new technologies. They just replaced classical columns with steel, um, steel angles. And this is kind of how I feel where we are with architecture and parafictionality and counterfactuals right now is that they're on the table and we have no idea how to even think about it. So I think this is actually a very exciting time for architects and to be an architecture student because there's actual new material on the table to start to work with that I think has potentially real consequences for humanity. Now, I'm gonna go through my work, some of my work in rather rapid fire suggestion, but one of the first projects we started to look at this on was our Helsinki Public Library project which, uh, as a side note, was a philosophical idea about hierarchy made into architecture. This isn't how I think the world should look. This isn't how I think you guys should design. This was an intellectual project run through architectural tools. And the idea was that if you wanted to remove hierarchical systems of symbolism from architecture, you would have to either not produce meaning or you would have to produce so much meaning that no one had privileged access to it. So one of the ideas we thought about was using collections of forms that were downloaded according to no particular agenda and recombined in a way that you could pull any particular symbolic content out of it, which meant there, were no, there was no official symbolic content. So you can see these accumulations of form. This is the uh, museum. This is a short video which has sound, which is always fun. Hernan did me the great favor of sending me a photograph of uh, Irata Isozaki talking about my work in Japan, in which he photoshopped the word weird over the front, <laughs> which I am, I am you know, part of the Oscar Wilde school of thought, which says the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about, so I consider this a small victory. Um, I've had students at Yale working with these types of forms, trying to get them out of the computer. This is a large four foot tall 3D print. These are some of the details. These are some of the interiors they produce. Um, we wanted to think how you would make this as a building material, so we collaborated with an Italian mining company in Carrera and CNC milled it out of a solid block of three foot by three foot marble, same marble that Michelangelo used in his sculptures. And you can see the minion. We just kind of <laughs> randomly picked apart. Um, not all of the work in my, object, uh, in my office is using this language of kit bashing. Some of the projects that we've done for the fashion industry are trying to think about that estrangement, that glimpsing or challenging of what we consider real and normal in our given reality through different venues. We did do one, we tried to do this uh, store for them. Uh, Nico Panda is a company owned by Nicola Formichetti. Uh, his online avatar is a panda bear. Uh, he did all of Lady Gaga's, he was Lady Gaga's creative director, he did the meat dress, all sorts of stuff, but so a lot of this work involves panda bears and uh, mermaids, because the mermaids are Lady Gaga's online avatar. So our initial attempt was to like take Michelangelo's Pieta and do it with a panda bear and a mermaid, just trying to like learn from the greats. But we just started piling all these characters together to produce this store and of course ran into budget pro problems <laughs> uh, and ended up just making these things all out of vacuum form plastic and putting them as many of them uh, adjacent as we could. Not the most um, direct translation of these ideas. 
Uh, these are just some of the plastic forms. I'm just gonna burn through these. These are a lot of like Lady Gaga's outfits. This is the Hong Kong store and it had LEDs and panels. We did one that was just a re refraction of view, so it was impossible to Instagram uh, or use, do this store on social media. The photographer from Vogue spent three hours in this space and said it was the most beautiful retail space she'd ever seen, but she couldn't get a single photograph <laughs> because if you put on a flash, it didn't have anywhere to land. Uh, we've done a lot of other projects. These are for H&M at the Coachella Music Festival, some interactivity, virtual reality, collaboration with Oculus Rift. We did a store for Diesel in Brooklyn that are using these types of technologies, but I've found actually that those technologies are becoming so ubiquitous that they no longer have the ability to generate curiosity. They're almost so normal now in everyday life that they've lost their prowess. Um, a project in the office which is on 42nd Street. It's the largest project we've ever been involved with in Manhattan. It's to build uh, two theaters on top of the historic Times Square Theater on the corner of 42nd and 8th. It's run by um, a number of organizations, Times Square Now, uh, Times Square Alliance. And it's actually right across the street from Madame Tussaud's uh, wax museum that has this giant hand, this creepy gold hand, like looming over 42nd Street, and our client just hated it. So our first response for our edition <laughs> was just that, you know. Um, but where we landed up was a project that has this kind of mirrored screen pixel technology. And one of the hardest things to do was get this by uh, the historic planning and preservation. So this was our video for them, which surprisingly enough, they loved. So all of the screens are uh, four feet by four feet, so they can be replaced easily when they break, but they can also be upgraded over time. So you might buy lower resolution screens for the lower areas and higher res I mean, for the higher areas, higher resolution for the lower areas where you can see them more readily. But it's basically two small theaters about half the size of this room that show immersive 3D movies. And this is how we got it by uh, historic Preservation Department by saying if you made the screen so you could see the historic New York Times building behind it, then it would be the world's first invisible building, which they bought. <laughs> uh, back to other projects in New York City, one of the First residential, oh, these are just some of the diagrams we're collaborating with an architecture company called ODA, which does a lot of construction in the city. Um, our first residential project in the city, uh, which eventually went to Annabelle Seldor Seldorf, who's building it now, it was adjacent to a building by Norman Foster, which is built. But we were trying to take this language and fuse it with the language of more or less generic curtain walls, which are the kind of default for any type of construction in Manhattan, and see if we could come up with some way to fuse the two. So these are some of the renderings and the floor plan. It's just a four bedroom, your typical four bedroom, um, uh, flat one floor per unit uh, in Manhattan. And once we lost that project to Annabelle, we had a little bit of free time in our hands, but we were so excited about designing a building for Manhattan that we built one on a site that was actually available for construction, and we dropped it into the media as if it was actually a real project, which is something architects do all the time, but we did it more um, consciously uh, to try to produce a parafictional situation where we got literally like death threats about how it was the end of architecture and we were responsible for ruining the entire city. But it was this project which the press, uh, it was picked up by over, I think, 6,000 media outlets. And um, I traveled to places like Istanbul and Cyprus to talk about it. It really did better in the press than financially. <laughs> but it used this language in conjunction with that kind of curtain wall uh, language. And one of the nicest um, responses we got was one person said it looked like Michelangelo had come back to life and designed a skyscraper. So that's not bad. I mean, Yeah, we take what we can get. It's that's the fakest news, right?
warning you, it's 102 stories tall. <laughs> oh my God. We're like a quarter of the way there. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to go through all that effort, <laughs> which led to a couple of upper projects, uh, a hotel project in Tribeca called the Metropole, which used a kind of puffier, panelized version of this language, a small residential building on Bond Street, which uses more a relief, uh, precast panels made out of this high density concrete called uh, tactile that takes really fine detail really well, and it doesn't uh, chip off. Um, we've used a kind of inversion of this language on a house project in Ile René Lavoisier in Canada, which is an island you can see from space created by a meteor like 10,000 years ago. But it's a really bucolic, like overgrown island, and the idea was to produce like a kind of parafictional ruin that we wanted to produce ledges where uh, uh, plant life could grow and that it would be built so, in a sense, solidly that it wouldn't require the maintenance that kind of a glass your typical glass house and second house in the woods would. But it was built of really thick, I mean it wasn't built, it was proposed to be really thick, robust marble panels that would uh, deteriorate attractively over time and bronze window frames. Bronze is the most resistant uh, material on earth. And the interior was trying to be uh, kind of a cave, cave-like open space because it was mostly just for entertaining. So it was a large entertainment kitchen, a small bedroom loft upstairs is the front door and a little indoor lagoon at the back. Uh, don't worry that uh, most of these are run no risk of being built. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a project, this is from my hotel room in Riyadh uh, last year for a project by an interesting uh, automobile collector who is in conversation with the Louvre to do the Louvre Museum of, uh, Louvre Automotive Museum. And this had an interesting program. It was basically a building to store cars and hold uh, events. And this is a, a, like the site. <laughs> so there was a lot of site analysis we had to do. <laughs> um, but just you know, to make sure that we lost the project, instead of doing the logical thing, was place it underground to protect the cars. We made a tower out of it. Uh, so the building was intended to be about, I think, 18 stories and a vertical elevator encased in glass that had a, basically just an automotive elevator that drops you off, takes you by the automotive collection, and then takes you up to the uh, space above. So this is the shaft. This is how you pull in. Um, and this is the final, uh, final rendering right before we lost it. Uh, which wasn't a big surprise. Um, you'll see some of the DNA of this in the gallery show, which I'll talk about in a minute. This was the entertaining space. Um, and then we shifted gears maybe last year and started looking at kit bashing of forms that weren't so legible as objects. And we developed this script, which is no big deal anymore. Everyone does their own scripts. But it was so dense that we had to import it into MRI software to cut it into pieces to understand what it was doing. And we started taking these and recombining these to produce a couple of projects, but it's basically our, our, our uh, kind of language generator that we took, and it's not accomplishing anything. It produces the language, but it's not like we're calculating performance based on this thing. So in a sense, you can consider it like a digital aesthetic machine. No music to that one. But our first proposal for that was the National Center for Science and Innovation in Kaunas in Lithuania. We got an honorable mention out of 155 proposals. The top three got, I think, 30,000 euros, like we got nothing. Um, but you can see the type of, the, the, the idea is that there's different layers of detail and scales. So it 
draws you and, in a sense, entices you to look closer and closer and closer. Every time you get closer to something, there's something closer to look at. This is one of the large atriums. Um, it, right as you walk in, there's a really large, tall atrium. It has, like, uh, I guess people think it looks like Rudolph Hall, where I teach, a little bit brutalist, and maybe there's that. We did a project for a, a competition at the Museum of Modern Art in Lima, Peru, that I think Tom also entered, but Tom snuck out. His competition was awful. <laughs> That's what he gets for sneaking out. No, his was great. Um, but the idea was a subterranean museum. It was required to be subterranean, so this is the original um, historic building it had to be next to, so we did a kind of courtyard, buried courtyard scheme where you enter through this one object and cascade down through a series of smaller rooms to an open area, and this is the entrance that has certain historic references piled into this relief. I won't bother to go through, but this is the sunken courtyard, and you can see this is where you enter. Interior vault space. We did a Harvey Milk competition that I think Florencia also entered. Hers was good. She's sitting here, so I, I'll say that. But it was also taking this idea of a grotto. How would you do, like, underground subway stations are notoriously revolting. And if you try to do it clean and modernist, it always deteriorates. So we wanted to do something that had the qualities of being cave-like, but also clearly artificial. So we did this type of fractal coffering, which is symmetrical. So it, once you go in, you see that it's like has a very rustic grotto-like, almost natural cave-like quality. But upon further introspection, you realize it's entirely man-made and there's recognizable classical forms. As you go farther back, we start to use classical motifs uh, recursively in some of the small little domed areas where there's different sculptures. Uh, we entered another competition called the Curleonis Concert Hall. Out of 125 entries, we received one of the four honorable mentions and again received no money. Uh, this we kind of went for broke, which um, went for Baroque. <laughs> no, but it was like a little bit... <laughs> We kind of overdid it, I don't know. I mean, like, it gets really frustrating at a certain point, like getting really close to building things, but we just really tried not to win this one. Uh, but we still got an honorable mention, but it really does have a qualities of like a kind of, maybe a little too future sci-fi. But the idea was that the entire contents of the concert hall would be unrevealed in any of the exteriors, which is the opposite of the contemporary concert hall trend, which is to put a glass wall underneath the seating, so you walk in on the corner, you know, pulling up the building, walking in on the corner, that thing. Um, the idea that seeing people milling around in a lobby is more interesting than seeing architecture. We wanted to do the reverse, where the interior is entirely defend, defended from outside view. So to the point where you can see roughly where you might enter, but you don't know exactly where that might be. And kind of a riffing on Frank Gehry's Disney Hall, where he has the organ at the back, we put the organ suspended from the seal, ceiling. Um, jumping up in scale, we've done some infrastructural projects which are informing the collaborative Yale studio and seminar that we're doing this semester. This is New York City, if roughly if Hurricane Harvey had hit New York City with the storm surge. And it produces an enormous, just, um, enormous path of destruction. There's no other way to say it, but New York City's plan right now is to save Wall Street, and this is Bjork Engel's uh, big U, which basically saves this much of the city, but if you see all of the stuff that's underwater, it destroys, I don't know, like a quarter uh, of the city. So the solution, if you're gonna use that strategy, was to produce uh, levees 42 miles in length to produce all of the dams needed to stop the East, uh, the East River from flooding. And our solution was to not build all those levees, but rather to just build three tiny little dams and drain the East River uh, to remove the flooding problem entirely, which is actually significantly smaller than similar dam projects like Three Gorges in China, uh, what they do in the Netherlands. And then we took this into its kind of fictional extreme and made geother massive urban geothermal vents and gave people access through these vertical parks down to this new park and farmland all behind this major dam. This was done, I should mention, for um, New York Magazine. They commissioned a number of architects to speculate on the future of the city. 
Uh, Diller and Scafidio did rooftop gardens. Sir Norman Foster's office did an extension to Madison Square Park. But I was struck at just how small architecture's thinking has gotten. And it's not that this is a feasible thing, but somehow in the last 50 years, architects have, maybe 20 years, architects have become much more interested in getting that like, you know, lead civil, lead, I'm sorry, lead silver for that like Hyundai dealership you're working on and not thinking in visionary terms anymore. Um, so this is lower Manhattan. Uh, my apartment's up there, so I would use this one, just in case you were curious. Uh, vertical parks with circulation that produce venting for the geothermal technology. This is a view from underneath the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, the last one is this project in Calais, who's was actually for my first client ever, who I did a, a kitchen for in Chelsea in New York City, ended up being, um, getting a very important position in Paris and has lands in Calais that he wanted to build something on. And this is similar scale to the last one that uses that kind of fractal language, but in concrete, cast um, in CNC milled formwork concrete. Uh, these are the plans, so you enter into a small kitchen, you go up one, it's like a split level, to a small living area and up another stair to a single bedroom and a single bathroom and um, shower. And you see the large picture window here, which faces the only good view that the property has. And this is just a kind of section where you get the sense of scale, but a very modest proposal, but I'm you know, very happy that these two proposals are actually possibly going to get built. So uh, on the note of the installation, the gallery installation, which opens in four minutes ago, um, we've taken some of the genetics from that particular project and the project in Riyadh and kind of fused them into this language for the geothermal futures machine. And we found that this language of fractal technologies actually has really interesting scientific properties. So I invite you to come into the gallery and learn about those scientific properties uh, following this lecture. So thank you.